We're so excited to introduce today's speakers. Part of the team that nurtures this beautiful space, Andrea and Angel, are here to share their passion for Texas nature and how that impacts who we are as people and creatives. Andrea DeLong Amaya is the Director of Horticulture at The Garden. Angel Horn is the PR and Marketing Coordinator at The Garden. Thanks. I would just like to welcome you guys to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center where I am. And in a moment, I'll hand it over to our Director of Horticulture, Andre Delongamaya. So I just wanted to take a minute to talk to you guys about uh, the rhythms of nature and how that can be really helpful and centering and comforting to us right now, um, anytime really. But right now, when our calendars of human invention are maybe a little less reliable. Um, there, there is a place outdoors where you can turn and either make some new friends um, in the flora and fauna around you uh, and the landscapes and getting to know them or to revisit, you know, some landscapes that you maybe haven't uh, got to slow down and spend time with. So I'd like to invite everyone to just kind of think about that throughout today. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't show you what's going on out here. Uh, so this is our um, this is our Savannah Meadow and it is one of my favorite spots at the Wildflower Center. It is uh, just a beautiful landscape that changes every season and kind of helps me keep track of the, the rhythms and the times of what's happening outside. And I especially want to give some shout outs to, um, to Dallas and to Austin because here is the basket flower, which is the Dallas flower uh, that we have selected for this fun celebration of nature. And it is very soft and it smells like honey. It's, um, it's kind of amazing. And you can see this example back here is why it has its name. These are the bracts and they look kind of like straw that's been woven together. And so that is where the basket flower gets its name. And this opens up after kind of a little punk rock mohawk into this big, beautiful flower that you see. Uh, it is a false thistle. It's not a, an actual thistle even though it looks like one. And then over here, we've got our Austin flowers. So shout out to Austin, um, my home right now. And these are our upright prairie cone flowers. And I, I just love the little skirts that they have and how they dance in the wind with that. Um, and right now, oh, I see a little bit of uh, Fort Worth back there too. There's some horse mint. So yeah, shout out to all the cities. Sorry, I don't have any Alamo vine or trumpet creeper out here right now. But I did wanna share that with you guys, just a little of the magic that's happening right now. Um, I also just wanted to invite you to, like I said, spend some time outside getting to know your native landscapes and revisiting them. Because right now, if you look back at your calendar from this time last year, you probably are going to see a lot of things that were happening that are, are not good predictors of what your life is like right now. We're all, um, our days look different, time feels weird, uh, things, you know, plans are tentative at best, and nature is sort of just doing what it always does. So if you were to look back in your field journal from a year ago or from two Mays ago, then it would, it would look fairly similar because nature just kind of has that comforting way of, of guiding us through natural seasons. So, you know, we might be missing South by Southwest and ACL and a lot of other things that we, as an Austinite, those are ones that I say, but there's also, you know, sports seasons that I know are being affected and uh, theater seasons and things. And, and those are all on pause or disrupted, but nature's just sort of marching along. And uh, I think there's a real comfort to that. It's, it's also, you know, when you get to know your native landscapes and you get to know some of the native plants, like the ones that Andrea is going to introduce you to today, then when you take a walk outdoors, it's sort of like uh, seeing old friends and it's a little bit of a roll call and it gives you a sense of where you are in, in time and space. And that's why native plants are just really beautiful um, and magical and at the same time practical, which uh, Andrea will also speak to a little bit. And the last thing I want to leave you with, because I, I am an Austinite and um, a dancer, and my husband's a musician, I think a lot about music, and obviously I've said the word rhythms a few times, uh, but if you imagine maybe the parallels between going on a walk, um, for me, this trail that I've been on many times, um, 
If you imagine going on a walk somewhere in your neighborhood or a trail that you like, or if you're lucky enough to have a park nearby or a botanic garden, then you can um, imagine that it's, it's like going to see a live band that you, are, that you like and hearing a song, maybe your favorite song by this band, and you're swaying along to the rhythms. Um, you are kind of, you know, you're hearing the guitar solo when you think you should hear it and you, you, ha you know the beat is familiar and the bass line is something that you know within you because you're just, you're moved by that music and it's something you know. But at the same time, because it's live and it's uh, unfolding before you and there's that element of spontaneity, uh, you might hear something that surprises you and it becomes a little bit of a, a novelty and a conversation. And, and it's just like that out in nature because on a walk you'll see right now, I would expect to come out here and see basket flowers because I see them every May and I'm still delighted to see them. Uh, but I might notice a species, like I hadn't noticed the horse mint just yesterday standing in this spot. And every time I come out, I see something new that I maybe had been too distracted, or maybe it's something that in past years has been in the seed bank and, and has been dormant. Um, this whole area has been burned by a prescribed fire, which I will not nerd, on out right, nerd out on right now, but definitely talk to me about it if you want to um, on the socials or in the Q&A. But this whole area was burned by a prescribed fire and now there's no, there's no sign of that. It's just all new life and, um, and old friends and new friends all coming together. So, so nature is a great opportunity to, to have some comfort and also that exciting novelty. And I encourage you to all take as much time as you can to, to get in touch with that. And without further ado, I'm going to send it over to Andrea Delangamaya, again, our director of horticulture. She's over in our theme gardens. I'm in one of our natural spaces, but she's in one of our more um, structured gardens. And she's going to introduce you to some native Texans over there. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Uh, we are the Botanic Garden of Texas. And what we're striving to do is have um, a good representation of native plants that are uh, native to different parts of the state. So for those of you that are uh, in places in Texas that aren't Austin, maybe you'll recognize some of these plants that are your um, outdoor neighbors. Um, so Angel addressed some of the temporal um, and seasonal topics, you know, basket flowers happening right now. This is its time of year, for example. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the spatial or geographic patterns of native plants uh, and their distributions a little bit. I think it's interesting, you know, as we're all, you know, trying to stay physically apart from each other uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's still safe to enjoy the company of our native plant friends. Um, we can stay at home with these native plants, stay at home with our friends, the plants. And that has another meaning too, as we look at how we're using native plants in our home range. Um, so if you're looking at plants that are native to your area, some of the things that you might see are things that we have in this, um, this garden. Let me back up just a little bit and talk about what we mean when we talk about the word native plant. Uh, it's a term that we're use, we end up using a lot, but it's, uh, there's a lot to it. And actually it's, it's kind of hard to define, but I think a good shorthand is, that a, uh, is to say that it's a plant that occurs naturally where it evolved. Um, and that's a pretty good catch for most things that you would uh, be talking about. I also think it's really important to overlay geography on top of that as well. If you were, say, to go to a garden center and ask them, maybe you, maybe you live in Fort Worth and you ask them for uh, some native plants, they might show you something that's native to deep east Texas, maybe, I don't know, a oak leaf, oak leaf hydrangea or something, which may be native to the country, may be native to Texas, but not necessarily from your area, and it may not do as well for you. And a lot of it goes back to what your goals are for using native plants. If you're trying to provide habitat, if you're trying to do a restoration, you might be a little bit more restrictive in your definition. Um, if you're just trying to find plants that are well adapted, um, you know, some of the plants from other parts of the state might do well in your area or maybe not. Um, if you're trying to support wildlife, it's probably better to stick as close to po as possible to your, uh, to your immediate area. Some people might say, I want plants that are native 50 miles, maybe 100 miles away from where I'm gardening. Um, and that might be one way to look at it. Or you could do it on an eco-region kind of basis. So 
In Austin, we are on the cusp of the Blackland Prairies to the east of us and the Texas Hill Country to the west of us. So depending on the kind of soils you're, you're um, gardening in, that will influence the kind of plants that you would select. Um, so just thinking about, uh, about that and really just thinking about why you're wanting to use native plants. Um, so I would like to ask you all to maybe just think about what are some of your favorite plants and why are those favorites? Um, maybe the plant reminds you of somebody you know, um, or maybe a place that you've been or a time in your life. And maybe this is something that you could post up on the chat during this meeting. Uh, I think it might be interesting to your fellow participants to see what your favorite plants are and why they're your favorite plants. There's some, always some good stories that come out of that. Um, then I'm sitting here in front of a plant garden, a garden full of friends that have been identified by the Wildflower Center staff. This is our staff favorites or our staff picks garden. And it's similar to like if you went to a bookstore or a grocery store where the staff there have labeled, you know, these are books that we recommend or maybe this is a great can of soup that you should try. So here we have a collection of plants that our staff have really appreciated for various reasons. Um, and auspiciously, we have an excellent geographic distribution of these plants or, or examples from different parts of the state. Um, so maybe you'll recognize some of these plants as some of your neighbors. So let me start with this little cute plant over here. Um, this is a plant called Cardinal Feather. Um, it's a Acalypha radians, which is in the Euphorbia family. So if you're familiar with Euphorbias, maybe you are familiar with the tropical acalyphas. This is a relative of that that's native to central, but really more south Texas. Um, it's adapted to regions that are fairly dry and you'll see it's kind of short and small. Um, it has kind of a red, reddish tinge to the foliage, which is pretty cool. That's another way that the plant helps adapt itself um, to uh, intense sunlight that it might be experiencing. Um, one of the interesting things about this species too is that you'll, you'll have male and female plants. So the flowers are different on one plant from another. So this is a male plant that has the flowers with the little um, uh, uh, anthers there. Um, the female flowers are much smaller in, in the foliage of the plant. So you can tell the difference between those. If you want them to seed out, you'd wanna have both. But um, actually I think the male ones are kinda cute. They, um, they're cheerful. Um, Amy, who's one of our staff members, says, I love moss, and this is about the closest thing I can think of that falls into the full sun native Texas category. The flowers are like little pipe cleaners. Definitely true. And then Leslie recalls seeing it for the first time in the wild at Lake Amistad, and it had a preciousness about it. It was one little plant, but it really stood out visually. So that's a little plug for the, uh, the um, cardinal feather. Um, another plant that I'd like to mention is this Mexican feather grass, which is native to West Texas, like the Trans-Pecos. And this time of year especially, but really any time, it just wants to be petted. It's really hard to walk past this plant and not just rub your fingers through it. Um, it's a very tactile kind of experience. And many plants that are native to this kind of hot, dry, um, very harsh, sunny conditions that you would find in the Trans-Pecos tend to have narrow leaves or small leaves, which is a way that the plant is adapted um, to have smaller surface area that's exposed to that kind of um, harsh UV light. Also, the smaller surface area of the, of the leaves can help reduce evapotranspiration, which allows the plants to conserve uh, water. A lot of plants that you'll see from desert areas also might have kind of a silverish um, look to them and that may be a result of little tiny hairs or maybe a waxy coating. Again, that's to help the plant retain moisture and also um, reflect some of the UV light. So um, feather grass and other plants that you might find in West Texas. Um, giant coneflower is another one that um, is just spectacular this time of year. Uh, I mean, look at that glory. Um, this is in the sunflower family, the Asteraceae. Uh, Rudbeckia maxima. Rudbeckia, you might be familiar with, is the genus of the um, brown-eyed Susan or black-eyed Susan. The species name maxima tells you, it, it refers to how large this plant is. This is a maxima plant. Um, again, Amy says, they're so tall. Some are taller than Lee, and Lee is one of our coworkers who's about 12 feet tall, so this is a big plant. 
they look prehistoric to me and even their foliage is pretty when they're not in bloom and that's definitely true it has a nice broad leaf um, kind of a coarse textured plant that looks great even in the winter time it has a nice rosette of this broad gray leaf foliage to it uh, Dick Davis who is another one of our staff members claims that it's so impressive with its outsized beauty and uh, I think that's definitely um, an accurate description of this plant being in the sunflower family it's really a great plant for attracting various kinds of pollinators you'll see a lot of butterflies uh, sometimes I'll see hummingbirds even though you think of hummingbirds as preferring plants that have a tubular shaped flower that might be red or orange um, hummingbirds will go to this plant also um, so it has a lot of benefits to it it's native to East Texas you might find it in a bar ditch um, the broad leaves are another way that the plant can absorb more sunlight um, makes a nice cut flower but also just in a garden it just have that really strong um, vertical form which makes it really uh, an impressive standout plant another little plant that uh, it's uh, fun to talk about is one of these salvias this is mealy blue sage or salvia farinacea it's in the mint family so it's related to mints um, other a lot of our culinary herbs are also in the mint family like basil rosemary thyme um, those are all plants that are in the mint family and being in the mint family being a salvia it also has fairly aromatic foliage which um, some people have used the leaves to make a, an infusion like a tea that you can drink I've tried it it's not my favorite um, but I do think it's fun to experiment with the edible properties of some of our native plants and we have a lot of wonderful ones that really do taste good a lot of them are perennials like the salvia farnesia the mealy blue sage so you don't have to replant them every year. They can be ornamental in themselves and then you just happen to be able to harvest them to use them uh, in your kitchen. Um, the species name, Salvia farinacea, uh, the plant has what's called farina, that's a botanical na name. And farina means mealy, which is where the name mealy blue sage comes from. Um, and so it's kind of a starchy texture to, uh, to parts of the plant. And that's where that name comes from. Um, Julie, one of our gardeners here, she says, I love all the members of the salvia genus, but this one's my favorite because of the blue coloring. And there are really very few flowers that have that deep blue color to them. Um, this is also a wonderful plant for attracting bees in particular, bumblebees. Um, a lot of our native bees will, uh, will definitely um, swarm on this plant. And I've also seen hummingbirds come to it. Again, you think of them going to red flowers, but they like to come to the blue flowers of this um, mealy blue sage also it blooms heavily in spring and fall and then kind of sporadically throughout the summer you can trim it back to new growth that comes out to the base if you want to refresh it during the summer um, but that's a really great native plant the mealy blue sage um, behind me here is another plant um, this is rock rose pavonia um, if you can see the flowers they're uh, nice clear pink um, they look very much like a hibiscus. You might recognize them as being related to hibiscuses. They're in the Malvaceae or the same family. Um, and this plant is really great for attracting um, some of the smaller butterflies. I see skippers, for example, that really like to come to it. This is a plant that blooms in the summer, as do most of the uh, Malvaceae. Most of the plants in this family really enjoy the heat. Um, they bloom throughout the summer and um, even though it really prefers heat and does well in the heat, it also can tolerate some shade. So it makes it a little bit uh, of a versatile plant. This is about mature height. It just kind of makes a nice shrubby plant. Um, behind here, we have uh, a grass that's Cytotes grama. And uh, Susan, one of our people that works in our nursery says, hey, it's the state grass of Texas. And this is true. Um, so honoring our state with our state grass, um, the uh, Cytotes grama. Another grass that we have nearby is a bushy blue stem. And Julie, uh, Julie uh, refers to the flowers. She says, it reminds me of the fur of a dog I had, fluffy and about the same color. So that's a pretty entertaining um, notation to make. <clears throat> So this is a collection of plants that um, are favored by various staff members. When people ask me what uh, some of my favorite plants are, you know, it makes me squirm. It really is like asking someone who their favorite child is. Um, my opinion varies from day to day, from uh, 
you know, if it's a Tuesday or Wednesday, it might influence what I really um, might be favoring at any particular time. Um, Mrs. Johnson purportedly had Texas bluebells on the top of her favorites list. And I've heard her also say that she really liked anything that was doing well for her. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind is what's gonna do well in your particular situation. Um, another thing that uh, I think ties in with this is that is a quote that Mrs. Johnson had. I don't have the exact quote, but she, it was something to the effect of she wanted Texas to look like Texas and California to look like California, Maine to look like Maine, to really try to counter the homogenization of the, tex of the American landscape. And really, if you're using locally native plants, you're going to be just by nature, you're going to be um, honoring your nat natural heritage and supporting that flavor, that local flavor, just like you would support a local business. Um, so planting native plants is a really great way to do that. Um, then let me, uh, she also had a quote, here's a quote for, um, I like it when the land speaks its own language in its own regional accent. So that's a nice way to, of looking at that. Um, so I wanted to also suggest another mental exercise and we'll go to East Texas. That's where Mrs. Johnson was born. So if you can imagine what it's like to walk through a piney woods, a piney forest in East Texas, what does it sound like? What does it feel like? What are the smells and the sounds that you experience? Um, what kind of memories does it invoke? And contrast that with an experience you might have had, say, in West Texas. And if you haven't been to these places, you can think of some other location that you, other locations that you've been. If you think of West Texas, what, what does that smell like or feel like um, or look like? And a lot of it, you know, in West Texas might be a lot about the geology, but in uh, East Texas, it's really dominated by plants. And even the geology in uh, West Texas is influencing the vegetation quite dramatically. And the plants themselves have a huge role to play in the feeling, the overall feeling of that space. Um, so think about those kinds of experiences and you know, disengaging all of your senses. Um, I think it's also helpful for us to be able to counter what we call plant blindness by looking and actually seeing the plants that are around us. We can, we can honor our local communities by supporting the natural world as part of our community. We can recognize that the plants are part of that community. And vast parts of our natural landscape really don't exist anymore. They're, um, they're altered in some way, largely by um, invasive species, but also just um, loss of, of space. So maybe we can say that we want to belong to a place rather than make it belong to us. Um, David Frost is a member of the California Native Plant Society many years ago had a quote that I really appreciate. He says, this is how we make our gardens here. These are the plants that tell us we're home. And I just feel like that's a wonderful way of summarizing using native plants in your landscape. So I hope that we will see you here out at the Wildflower Center at some point. Um, we are open um, and would love to show you around and continue this conversation. And with that, I think I'm gonna send it back to Angel. Gosh, I loved reading all the comments and thank you so much, Andrea. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing a lot before we go to q and I just want to acknowledge is that people have a lot of really special connections to native plants and to landscapes and to uh, things that take you back. And, and that's one thing, another way, you know, you can write birthdays and anniversaries and things on a calendar, but another really special thing that just happens in our brains is that when we, um, when we see a certain plant in bloom sometimes, or when we see berries or fruits coming off of a certain plant, it might take us back to a person who's a real comfort and joy to us. And um, maybe they, it's someone we gardened with or someone who taught us about this plant, or, you know, I, it's not a native plant, but I think of my husband when I think, when I see loquats in bloom, because that's when we first started uh, dating was the loquats were blooming. So it's a way that we keep track and keep time and keep rhythm and it's just, really special um and i I'm, i could talk about it all day i won't i'm gonna let us uh turn it over to the host to do some q a if you guys have any questions but thank you so much